Hi, I'm Bill Mosley, and you're listening to the Dave and Creech Show. <laughs> This is the Dave and Creech Show, the only podcast where podcaster C.J. Creech and actor Dave Sheridan come together to talk all things entertainment with your favorite entertainers. Want to ask our guests a question? Tweet them to at Dave Sheridan or at CJCNOV88, and they may be asked to our guests live on the show. We do have to ask you stay seated during the podcast because this ride may get a little bit hilarious. Now here's your hosts, Dave and Creech. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dave and Creech show. He's Dave and I'm Creech and we are now on episode 11. That is just crazy, right? Episode 11, it's going so fast. It's awesome. It um, really is, and it, it's hard to believe we've already spent almost over twenty hours talking to each other for this this uh, podcast already. Yeah, I, I'm actually uh, I'm looking at because uh, you said I was announced on this Mad Monster Party. Is that where I'm going? Mad Monster Party. Yes. Well, it's, I I don't know if they put it on the official um, page, like their website yet, but it is on their Facebook page. Where did you see it? Yes. It's on their Facebook page. Oh, the Facebook. Got it. Yeah, they didn't put it on the the regular one. Uh, and Ricky Rackman is Saturday only, which is good. I'm going to have to text him to tell him I'll be there because he lives uh, in Charlotte as well. Oh, no, I do see me. Devil's Reject Scary Movie, Dave Sheridan. Well, there you go. But they Have didn't a- put the Dave and Creech podcast on there. Seriously. Are there any podcasts on here? No, not that I know of. I like that Eugene Clark's going to be there. He's he's almost like kind of a regular. Uh, obviously, Bill Mosley. We always, you know, it's not really a horror convention if Bill Mosley isn't sitting there, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Mad Monster is definitely the horror genre convention. Oh, so yeah. I think everybody. Every, it's mainly anybody from horror. I mean, they do have Colossus from Deadpool and uh, young Anna and Elsa from Frozen. It's weird. Uh, Buff Bagwell is going to be there, you know, from uh, wrestling. And I was just watching my uh, – my the guy that's building my house, his name is uh, The Profile Rick Stone because um, I know you're into wrestling. And uh, he wrestled Buff Bagwell in the WWE and whatever. So – um, um he just showed me one of the matches. So now I got to tell Rick Stone that uh, Buff Bagwell is going to be there signing autographs. I'll we'll have to get Rick to come up and smash a chair on his head. Exactly. Yeah, get him to, to put on an impromptu wrestling match that we can record exactly. and release for uh, the Dave and Creed show. We got Derek Mears will be there, Malcolm McDowell, um, William Cat from The Greatest American Hero. So that's kind of cool. And also Pippin, by the way. Um, James Duvall will be there. He's a, a friend of mine. Gets me my drinks for free. So, uh, yeah, you have to look at the guest list, too, and think about who you want to uh, sit down and interview, right? Who you uh, I've, Actually, actually, I've, I've already been done that. Um, oh, okay. I mean, I'd like to get as many people as possible, of course. But, I mean, but you've already, George Romero. Didn't you already, and, okay, and yeah, he's, a, high, he's an important High man. on that list. Okay, Romero, and what's the other one? Malcolm McDowell. Uh, See, Malcolm McDowell, I wouldn't know what to ask that guy. Like, g- give me one question that you would ask Malcolm McDowell. Uh, let's see. First one would be, how did you prepare uh, to take on the role of Donald Pleasance in the Halloween remake? Got it. That's not bad. That's a good question. So what was the name of the actor that he uh, – what was the the original guy? What was his character? What was the real name? The well, the, his real name was Donald Pleasance, but the character was Doctor Loomis. Ah, now is Donald Pleasance? Is he dead? Yes, he's been dead since like ninety six. Oh, that's a shame. And he played the president in Escape from New York, right? Yes, he did. Oh yeah, the guy building my house. Uh, his name is Top Cat, and he's a rapper. 
and he works with the profile, Rick Stone, who's a professional wrestler, this will give you a good reason why my house is not complete. I have a professional wrestler and a gangster rapper building my house. And Top nice. Cat <laughs> Top Cat drives with his crew of like he always brings like four or five other crew guys, you know, and they're also like they're in his rap gang, you know. They drive he drives a Cadillac with all his tools, you know, his tools and stuff in the trunk. He doesn't have a truck. He drives a caddy. Uh, and it's like somewhere in the eighties, the caddy, but it looks like the car that the Duke was driving, you know, when he's going across the bridge and escape from New York. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the only, he just doesn't have the chandeliers hanging from the front, but it's that kind of car. You know what I mean? With a bunch of, well, he also doesn't have uh, Isaac Hayes, uh, but he is Isaac Hayes. He's top cat. He is, you know, he's the man and he's framing my thing. And somehow, uh, I guess when you leave it up to a professional wrestler, the profile Rick Stone, when you leave it up to him to hire, you know, all your crew and the guy's been, you know, he's been suplexed on his head multiple, multiple times. Um, especially the, in the match I saw with Buff Bagwell, he got, he got his ass handed to him. So he definitely is suffering from that CTC, uh, Whatever they have that, you know, that stuff that they, they made that concussion movie with Will Smith or whatever, like where he's had concussions and now he's got a little brain damage. And this is what I get. This is what I get in life. But I didn't know he was a professional wrestler until after I hired him. Next thing you know, one day we're working and then he said, I looked you up, man. You're doofy. And I was like, oh, shit. And he goes, that's my favorite movie. I go, oh, great. And, uh, and then he then he brought up the fact that he was a professional wrestler that he was he had a contract with the WWE in 2000 so um so he's got a lot of tape and he's been in the NWA or not NWA was yeah is that the right is that the one that's sort of like a franchise now that can go around the country yes they're out of Nashville right or they used to be well, there's there's TNA, which is runs out of Nashville, and I think maybe the National Wrestling Alliance runs out of there too. I'm not yeah, sure. or it used to, and now it's just a franchise. You just have to you you pay a little licensing right to have that. And they just have them. You know, my friend was sort of the NWA in um uh he was NWA in uh, Los Angeles. So it really wasn't connected to the one to say if there's one in Chicago, they really aren't related except for like, they kind of collect franchise money from it. Okay. Well, that's definitely interesting that you've got a rapper and a wrestler. Um, Oh, you know? Yeah. And, and, and the profile Rick Stone is going to perform in May in Fort Mill, South Carolina. And I'm going to be his manager. I think I'm going to manage him and, but I'm going to manage him as Dave Sheridan. I'm going to actually manage him as myself, as a as an actor, Hollywood guy that has decided to buy wrestlers to to invest in wrestlers. Like I think it's a good investment is going to be my thing, and and I'm inventing a thing where um our whole thing of the wrestling is that we're really into performance enhancing drugs, the PEDs. I totally believe yeah. in supplements, and so I've got a whole line of the profile supplements that we're always pushing so i'm gonna make like you know i'm gonna take candy bars you know like uh just regular uh, hershey bars but i'm gonna print up profile performance bars like wrappers and give them to all the kids you know what i mean but they're gonna have all sorts of ingredients you know like my, the whole like it, it may give you a four-hour boner type of thing you know <laughs> oh gosh and and so like all the drugs all the pills and stuff and shots and needles in the butt I'm going to administer all that stuff during the match. I'm going to take his blood pressure. You know, like I'm, I'm literally maintaining his performance enhancing drugs during the match. So kind of like Popeye with the spinach when he's about to get beat, I'll have a little funnel and I'll have like, you know, I'll give him some supplements, some drugs down the mouth, some pills. They'll just be Tic Tacs and stuff, but it'll give him the power he needs back, you know, and he'll start kicking ass again. So the whole thing will be kind of like a, the I uh, what was um I was it Ivan Drago who was uh what was the guy's name in Rocky three that that uh, Dolph- you're, you're talking to a guy who the only Rocky he's seen is um, Rocky Balboa. I don't even know which one that was. Which one was Rocky Balboa? 
That was the fifth one before Creed, the most recent one. Uh, the one where he he spoiler alert lost at the end to the to the young and up and coming boxer. Was it Tommy Gunn? Did he lose to Tommy Gunn in that one? I can't even tell you the the the, the name of it. The name of the guy. I just know that um, I was very mad that he lost, but I guess it makes sense that he lost. You were you were mad that he lost. It's the only one you've ever seen. Exactly. So I was like, okay, this dude's gonna win. Okay, I, I know how this goes. And then he lost, and I was like, what the hell? Rocky loses in every movie. Did you not know that? I did not know that. I haven't, like I said, I haven't seen a single Rocky movie. No, other than Rocky Balboa. I don't know if he lo- – there might have been – I think he might have won in two and might have won in three, but – I'm assuming he won in one because it's no. the yo Adrian. He didn't no. Win in- no, he, lo- he loses. He loses. He celebrates by a, a, a that, loss? Yeah, that's the win. He wins in life even though he loses. He went toe-to-toe with the champ, and they said he was a nobody. And he's like, Adrian, and he loves her. He knows she's more important than his wrestling, that he won with her. He won. He won. He was a winner, uh, even though he lost. That's what makes that movie – that's why that movie was uh, so big because, you no, know, he doesn't win. He doesn't win. He hits a bunch of meat. The guy pounds meat for training. Do you really think that guy's going to win? He he literally is kind of – the thing about Stallone is in that movie, he kind of plays a, a mentally challenged human being. Uh, he, he goes on this date and he taps this little canary and almost kills it. He's like, Hey buddy. Hey buddy. Hey buddy. He's tapping this canary in the head and it's totally screwed up. The canary is kind of like, you know, he damages the canary in the pet store. Like that just tells you who he is. You know what I mean? (laughs) Oh yeah. And the only other thing I I know is that Hulk Hogan, I think was in three as Thunderlips or something like that. Some random name. Right. Yeah, two was the one where he's like, I'm going to get a rematch, you know, because he lost. But Standard sequel thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I think in number one, though, he doesn't get knocked out. And that, that's also what makes him win is because he stands up the whole time. You know what I mean? Even though the guy's just beating him, like pounding him. And he's like, I could keep taking it. You know, he's getting hit. It's a good movie. Rocky one and Rambo, you know, First Blood, those are two. Did You've seen First Blood, right? Once again, the only one of Rambo I've seen is actually uh, Rambo, the most recent one. I hadn't seen any one, Rambo, First Blood, the second, or yeah. the third one. Yeah, that one's not bad. The, the last Rambo one was not bad. I actually pitched him another Rambo one called, uh, I think it was called Final Blood. Final Blood, because the first one was called First Blood. And uh, I don't want to, I can't talk any further of that because um, that's all I'm going to say. But, um, you should see First Blood, dude. First Blood is what put him on the map. That's an actual Academy. Well, uh, the Rocky Rocky was nominated for Academy Awards. Man, you got to see that movie. That's a classic. That's got to be a top twenty-five movie of all times. And um, but First Blood is also very. It's pretty good. It's a pretty good movie. I, I'm. I, it's a little bit more popcorny at the end, but uh, it's not like the other Rambo's. This one's more like the Vietnam vet that comes to the town. He's getting kicked around because he's got long hair, you know, sign signs everywhere, that kind of song or whatever, you know. And then, but they didn't know who they were messing with. They were messing with a guy that was like captured by the Vietnamese, and he snaps, and he's just literally a killer. And he snaps, and he just takes, he just kills the whole town. He just destroys the whole town. It's crazy. But so in that one, he's not fighting Russians or, you know, some army. He's fighting like a local sheriff and townspeople that are just regular Americans. And he just brutalizes them. He just snaps. It's really good. Hmm. And then he runs off in the woods and they got to go find him. And he's like, yeah, he's all crying. He's like, they're all dead. They're all dead. Like all his guys that he fought in Vietnam with are dead. And he's breaking down. You got to see that movie. It's pretty good. I think it'll change your perspective. What's weird about this conversation is those are, you know, two of, uh, that's the whole reason that Sylvester Stallone even has a career at all are those two movies. And then when you see those two movies, I think you'll look back on his career and go, well, now I know what that guy did to get why he was able to make those other movies, you know, because a lot of those are not that good, but why, what made this guy a superhero or superstar? So now they're doing Expendables five or four, whatever one they're on. Yeah, I think it's 
they're doing expended bells. Yeah. Oh, they're be doing, a regular... they're, they're, they've ran that idea into the ground now because they're doing an, another expendables. They're doing right. expended bells, like you were saying. And then there's uh, a horror expendables coming out, too. I see you wrote here Sarah Wayne Callies is back for a new season of Prison Break. I don't even know if I said her last name right. Sarah Wayne Callies, yes. Um, you did say it correct. And she is, um, which actually I'm pretty excited for. I don't know. Did you ever watch the original series of Prison Break? I did, yes. So what role is Sarah Wayne Callies going to play? Uh, she's actually reprising her role as Sarah Tancredi from the original series. God. I don't. It's been, I don't remember it. I barely remember the the show though. So what did the show she play was amazing. Um, she was Sarah Tancredi on that, um, and she was like the the main love interest of uh, the main character. And uh, I guess, which is funny enough, uh, for, at least with Sarah Wayne Kelly's career, she was one of the most beloved characters on Prison Break. Uh, as a matter of fact, they killed her off in the third season. And the backlash from the fans was was so much that Fox actually retconned her death and brought her back for the fourth season. Okay, how did they do that? Basically, they said that uh, because she was she was supposedly killed, and uh, she was shown uh, the the main character was shown pictures of her dead. Uh, and then in the in the after the backlash and everybody um, getting on Fox's case. They, they wound up coming up with the storyline that it was just somebody who looked like her that they killed to try to get him to, to uh, do the, the job that they wanted him to do. Got it. So was it that Secret Service guy that killed her or like who killed who, who killed who did the original killing? It was not the Secret Service guy. It was uh, a member of that basic authority that, that controlled everything that he worked for, of course. Uh, the Secret Service guy had worked for. Yeah, but I thought was, I thought that that show sort of, and I, I, you know, I love to use that term, jump the shark, but it got a little. I felt it got a little ridiculous. You know what I'm saying? It just, I liked it. The first season was brilliant. When uh, I think when it got weird was when they went when all of a sudden they were down in like the South American prison. You know what I mean? It was just kind of like I, what, I agree with you a hundred percent. Love the first two seasons. Then they went to the South American prison in the third season. And I, I agree. I felt it jumped the shark. And then the fourth season was abs- an absolute joke as well because then they um, – basically what happens on that is they have this whole daddy issues, like this whole I am your father Star Wars what? type thing for the first part of the, the season. And then at the very end, uh, the main character just randomly starts getting nosebleeds that he apparently had the whole entire series and we didn't see. And dies. And then they released like an episode after the fact of uh, the final break where they had to break into prison to get uh, Sarah Wayne Callie's character out. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for her to come back to the show, but I'm hoping um, that it's, it's not like the last two and more like the first two. Right. Here's what was weird, too, is like that one guy that played the prison guard. And I don't know that actor's name. The guy that played the prison guard, like in the first, whether it's first season or first two seasons. Next thing you know, he was like near the end, he was working with them. And he was a total like kind of like just like guy in shorts. You know what I mean? He wasn't like this. He was such a good bad guy. And then he was just like, I'm working for you guys now. I'm okay. You know, remember that? Yes. I remember that, and uh, also one of the actors on that show that – well, actually, I'm just really excited that this show's coming back because I'm appro- we're approved for Press Through Fox. So around the time this show's going to be released, I'll be able to get their uh, contact information for the entire cast, and I definitely want quite a few of them on the podcast. Um, but one of my favorite actors from the original one was Robert Nepper, and he played Teabag. Yep. And that was the guy – they wound up you know, cutting his hand off and everything, and – that guy just played that role so perfectly. And even though the other seasons kind of sucked, I mean, he was still killing it every single episode. Yeah. Cause he also became like, uh, he was working with them too. Right. 
Yeah, yeah, his his was the the he was kind of like a more fast moving version of the uh, that security guard because he would jump every couple episodes it seemed between I'm with you now I'm against you now I'm with you again now yeah. we're we're stuck together by chance but we don't like each other now we like each other so that that you know that kind of got a little old too but yeah but but it, but in the factor. in the first season he kind of came off like a really really creepy child molester rapist murderer you know what i mean like that he that he murdered little boys you know what i mean like he was that kind of wayne gacy kind of character that you know was basically put in prison because he had little boys like they found him you know murdered little boys and did stuff with them that's kind of how he came off in that first season and it was like how do you let that guy in, in the group you know he was definitely creepy you know so um but where where would where would they take a new version of Prison Break? That's a good question. Um, all they've revealed so far of the actual um, the synopsis of it is that it does indeed take place after the final episode, and apparently, much like they did with Sarah Wayne Callie's character, basically her character's moved on from the death of Michael, who who she was with for the most of the series, and uh, she got married, had kids so on and so forth. And, and she somehow finds evidence that Michael didn't actually die, that he right. quote unquote faked his death. So, which makes him look like a giant douche nozzle for, you know, apparently I, I, she was pregnant at the end of the series and, you know, that he left his brother uh, to, to, you know, to fend for himself too, at that point, then if he supposedly faked his death, but Basically, she's trying to find him and get to the bottom of everything that's going on with it. Um, and obviously, everybody's coming back. So I'm, I'm guessing uh, Teabag will wind up switching sides a couple of times. And uh, <laughs> everybody that then dies is going to come in and, and be like, hey, let's go break into wherever this guy's at and find out where he's at. That's yeah. my assumption for what's going to happen, at least. Well, I'm hoping Teabag is like a chemistry teacher now. I moved on. I'm a chemistry teacher. I'm at I'm in high school. <laughs> like something real. Like what would be like the most mundane, like lamest job for him to have? And they finally meet up with him again. It's like no, you're Teabag. Hey, that's in the past. I moved on. <laughs> it's like, what, what's he doing? You know what I mean? It would be funny. Exactly. Um, let's see what's next on the list. Well, what I did this weekend was I filmed at OSCW, which is our local wrestling down here. I, uh, when I'm not podcasting, I'm I'm filming wrestling, and uh, our, our good old our our buddy Kevin Phoenix was there, and uh, yeah. he officially turned heel this weekend and uh, has turned a, a 360 on what his character was. Um, so it, it's very interesting. I feel like there's probably going to be a, another documentary chapter coming out very soon, but basically what, what he's doing now, cause you know, he was the Southern rebel, the, uh, the African American wrestler with the Confederate yeah. flag and all that. But well, wasn't, now, he a heel, wasn't he a heel before he was a no. bad guy, right? Isn't it, no. isn't a, is a heel a bad guy or not? Heel is a bad guy. A he baby face a guy. Is, is a good guy. He wasn't a bad guy here in the South, at least. Oh, I thought he was um, the bad guy. He wasn't, but he definitely is without a doubt. Now he's, uh, he's changed his name. He's now Kevin Keith Cochran. And that's spelled with all K's and he's doing a, um, <laughs> and, and all, uh, you know, kind of like a, a black supremacist type group, um, where he's, he's fighting for equality for, for his race. So it's, it's actually, it's very entertaining to see him completely switch from one extreme to the exact other end. Um, so is yeah. he, does he got like a black Panther kind of vibe going on? Is he got like the black beret or something? Or? Um, no, he actually has like, uh, he just, he does wear all black. Um, but he has a new group of, uh, African American wrestlers, like a stable that they are oh. all, um, are a part of called the, the ENT. Um, and yeah, they, uh, one of their poses is they pose with their hands up almost like the, the black power, uh, symbol. 
Right. And they, they, they do beat down the, the white wrestlers. So it's, it's, he's getting a lot of heat down in the, here in the South once again. Um, but it, it's, it's amazing. It's doing really well. Well, I'd have to check it out. Maybe he'd have to come up, uh, and, uh, take on, uh, the profile, Rick Stone and his new manager, me, Dave Sheridan. I got to tell you, I think that science will prevail because we, have science on our side. What I, what we use with our wrestling is science. It's all very strategic, all scientific. I know exactly his thresholds. I know what his blood level needs to be. I know his, you know, the testosterone levels that we need to maintain for the profile. This is what I'm working with. This is what we bring from Hollywood. You know what I'm saying? And as I invest in these wrestlers, because I think it's a really smart investment. I think that, you know, these are like racehorses to me. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like owning a football team. So you let him know, Kevin Keith Cochran, anytime the the profile well, he, Rick Stone will be there. He he definitely uh performs in, in South Bend, North Carolina a lot. Um so was this wrestling Mary. Yeah. Really quick, was this match was this one that you went to, uh the OSCW? Was it um was it in Myrtle Beach or where was it? It was actually in Charleston. Okay. Yes, and it was uh, it was actually the first sold out event that they've done ever, and at this this wrestling event, like they had to bring in more bleachers, and they were still it was basically standing room only, um, just which was pretty impressive. Um, how many? How many people? How many people? Ooh, uh, two hundred. That's not bad. Yeah, I mean, especially for, you know, indie. And what do they charge per ticket? Like five bucks or ten yeah, bucks? It's, or yeah, it's five dollars at the door. Right. So now does 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 KKK get paid any money to perform? Or is it does he get a does he get a hundred dollars or what's his deal? Kevin does get paid to perform. How how much this is it this is, I, I don't know the exact amount, but this is one of those where because the actual promoter himself is is a former professional wrestler, right? Um, and uh, from what I've heard from the other guys, he pays really well. Uh, he pays fairly, um, which you you sometimes don't run into out on the circuit. Um, well, where else but, yeah. do they get their money from? Because if you're saying it's five dollars and there's two hundred people there, that's only a thousand dollars at the door. So, well, I don't know about other wrestling promotions, but this one actually has like local sponsors and stuff that that you know, right put up the money for certain things so right right that's one of the uh one of the ways they make the money got it so you filmed that and now you're thinking that you will be continuing another chapter in the documentary because it's sort of a turn in where he went i like that exactly yeah yeah i mean um we covered pretty much the 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 first part of this and now he's entering a new chapter definitely with this this character and it'd be uh uh, you know, a definite exciting addition to this ever continuing and uh, being improved and worked upon documentary. That's good. Did you shoot behind the scenes stuff or just the match? For this one, I just shot the match um, just because it was so. Um, they, they they didn't really have any privacy as well, so there wasn't there wasn't much to capture on that. I did get the full turn. I actually put put that on Facebook where he actually um, – see, he came out as the, the Southern savior, you know, the, the good guy and everything. And then he did the turn in the match and then completely um, went off on the fans and everything in an in in interview um, in the ring. And it was, it was amazing. I got the entire thing, obviously. Uh, some great footage out of that. But, yeah, it's – it's been being shared around quite a bit. I mean, it was a really good promo that he cut too, but he, he had the fans pretty angry. <laughs> oh, uh, I wish I, I can't wait to see that then. Uh, and then what did you shoot on? Just one camera? It's like, we shot on two cameras, yep. actually I, technically three cameras. Okay. Um, because how is, it, how is it technically three? What do you mean? I used my phone for some of this because my okay. phone shoots, okay. uh, High def uh, slow mo. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. That's so. Cool. Like, I got yeah, I got like some of the flips and stuff that they did in slow mo. 
Did you lock that off? You mean you locked off your camera or, or you just had to like switch cameras really quick on all right, I want to get a little bit of this. With Pretty that. much switch. I mean, I've seen enough wrestling matches to know when certain things are coming and I was like, okay, they're going to do this. So then I would set up the slow-mo camera and, and get that. Um, but basically we shot um, with a portable camera, uh, like a, a Nikon D5300. And then the, um, then I used the phone for slow-mo and then we had a, a, another one on a, on a crane to get a stationary high up view, um, that we could still move back and forth and everything. So we, we had the crane running and, uh, got it from that angle as well. That's awesome. All right. Well, you'll have to cut together a little teaser or something at least so I can see it. Well, I can I can send you the the turn. The turn's on Facebook. I can just um, yeah, send me the link. Send me yeah, the link. I'll send you the link because it's it's public. So any, you know, even if you don't go on your Facebook to watch it, you can still <laughs> access it. And I know you mentioned that Strip Club Massacre uh, is nearing completion of their filming, but they're going to start like a, a new Indiegogo. Did they already start the new Indiegogo? What's what's yes. going on with that? Yes, it, it, there is a new Indiegogo going around. Um, they uh, are nearing completion of the filming. They're actually, I think, one or two more weeks, and they are done. Um, and the the people that do, that had um, they they did an Indiegogo to raise money for for the filming itself. Plus, they had some people that that put money into it, which comprised their budget. Uh, they've you know they're nearing the end. They've shot that now. They're doing an Indiegogo um, to help fund the completion of it and try to to get it spread as far as possible other than just doing the premiere in Georgia, for example. They, so they they're good doing an Indiegogo to fund the distributing aspect of it, you're saying? Yes, okay, exactly. Yeah. Right. And um, they, they've got a, a bunch of cool little uh, bonuses for each level. Like you can get autographed posters from the cast. You can get tickets to the premiere, a prop from the movie. You can meet Aaron Brown. Um, some Some great – actual uh incentives but yeah they they uh I'll, I'll send you the link and we'll we can tweet it out uh definitely if anybody's got five ten you know however much or if you know people who have money and would love to donate to be a part of the movie then uh definitely you should donate remember i i do have a uh some short scenes in this movie so i'd appreciate it too from being on the inside yeah, and I just want to, hey, man, if you can put some of that money towards the, the premiere, then, you know, I mean, like, you know, to make the premiere, like, even more kick-ass, because I'm coming to the premiere, right? When's that? We don't know yet. It's like July, right? Yeah, we don't have an exact date for that, but yeah, definitely. And, uh, yeah, we'll we'll, def- we'll both be at the premiere for sure. That is going to be pretty pretty badass. And actually, here's the at thing. At least that's what, what the- you're telling them. At least that's what, you know, you might have to pay. Dave's coming. Dave's coming. Oh, uh, yeah, Dave's not coming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, at the end, what's the credits roll? What's to make sure my role's in there? It's like, yeah, Dave's not coming. Yeah, um, but I know. See, here's I will the thing. be there. I, th- I will. I think they, they're already planning ahead that you're not going to be there because uh, in the what they've documented in their Indiegogo, they want to do premieres in other cities. And one of the cities that they're talking about is Charlotte. Oh, okay. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, they're they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna make sure they get Dave one way or another. Right, right, right. With that being said, that is going to wrap it up for uh, our regular talk segment this week. There was some great talk news that we weren't able to get to this week. Um, if you looked on Twitter, I've posted that stuff that you can look at it now or you can wait. We will talk about it next week for sure. But now we are going to go ahead and get into the Walking Dead wrap-up this week because Dave is on the line, Annalise is on the line, so let's get to it. This is all connected. You show up, and now three of us are gone. Hey, 
Howdy, guys. Called saving money. Hey, What's Gina. going on, Creech? So we we went back to do the uh, the the old version of of this. So how did everybody like this week's episode of The Walking Dead? I thought, I thought it, was it was great. Great, yeah. yeah. See, same thing. Oh. Well, well, I think okay. it was the opposite of what we thought because remember we thought it would go back to the compound and it would just be like a reset kind of a thing. Yeah. So, and it, I wouldn't say it was a it it was it, it was a contained episode. You know, it really didn't have a lot of characters in it. It was contained, sort of saw like into the room and a couple rooms in this little dark area. So, you know, in shooting it, they didn't have a lot of moving pieces. But it was definitely not a reset in, like, the whole, like, okay, let's just have these conversations now until we reset to an action pack. It, I felt like it delivered on a level of, you know, it had a, like, um, the thriller element to it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It was very raw emotionally. It really tested yeah. both of those characters. It really took that. I mean, Carol was already teetering before, and then, like, this just drove her over the edge. Like, we see how it's really affecting her. Like, she does not – she's more like Morgan than she would like to admit now that I think about it. I mean, I think about their action, interactions before, and she was kind of just, like, brushed him off and was like, you know, stay away from me. I don't care about your philosophy. Oh, uh, you know, this is how we have to do it. And now we kind of see that she, you know, she agrees with him. She doesn't want to do these things, even if they are, like – you know, you, yeah, that that had to happen, that really sucks, you know, but it just, she saw three kids die, I mean, one being her own, that that would mess anybody up, I mean, she's bound to have a break at some point, and I think this really showed it in this episode. Yeah, like, yeah, and like we talked about last episode, it's that she cannot, you can't live in both worlds, you can't be the den mom cooking cookies and then have a machete at the same time. And once mm-hmm. you get stuck on that kind of tightrope of which one do I want to be, and the Morgan thing makes good, you know, that's a good point where, like, has he sort of, you know, is she heading towards him or she, you know, he sort of, as he pushed her to one side a little bit more, you know, in his on conversations yeah. with her. Um, right, and he wanted, possible. and he wanted to change somebody, and I think he picked the. Uh, he unknowingly is is Carol is kind of his student, you know. I think they're both unaware of it, but he is teaching her something. She was listening. We know that she, you know, takes all these things in, and you know, now we're seeing the way she's processing it, and you know, right. she's she's hearing all his words, well, and yeah, I, I'd like to see their interactions now. It's sort of interesting, like I said, like how when society dies, you know, in an apocalyptic way, you know, there's these remnants of they're trying to rebuild society, but they're also trying to rebuild society from what they remember it, you know, like how mm-hmm. society, criminal, how criminals are treated, how people interact. They're still holding on to what they had before, so here he is building a jail cell, you know, just like when he was held in the jail cell. And that's kind of a mm-hmm. macrocosm of people can be reformed in prison. People, oh, we can sentence this guy and we can hold somebody in a prison and they can, you know, we can recuperate their brain to release them back into society where they can be a functioning person in society where we know that 90% of anyone that's in jail is going to end up back in jail, you know, and so, mm-hmm. and Rick, being a, a, a sheriff in his previous life, he's coming from the other side of capital punishment of there is no prison here. We're just killing everybody. You know what I mean? It's death. Mm-hmm. Death is the sentence, you know, and, and then going in to these, like for these, for these saviors, he, he has no, you know, their idea was like, we're not even giving these people a chance. We're not going to talk to them. We're not going to discuss it. We're not going to let them, you know, we're not going to see if we can change the way they are. He's literally like, we're just going to wipe them. We're just going to wipe them away. Um, yeah. And, and, and like I I think I said, I, yeah, I've been saying this since I watched the episode, you know, Rick, man, he just, 
he did not think this one through, and it's so un unlike him. And I just, I can't believe his method of thinking when he brought everybody into this. Like, it was just so half-assed. And it's just so naive of him to think that it was just, they were just going to run through this compound and, oh, we got it taken care of. Hey, we're all good guys. Now we got food and we're just straight. <laughs> I, it was, I, could, I couldn't believe she did that. Like, it just really drove me crazy. And it, when Negan gets here, he's going to be knocked, Rick's going to be knocked down a few notches. And I think he needs to be. Because if you look at it from Negan's point of view and the Savior's point of view, our people are no better than, than the wolves. I mean, yeah. we know our group's intentions and we understand them, but when you think to the wolves, they came in w without any warning and killed our people. What is different from what our group did? You know, but yeah. oh, no I can see why yeah. Negan's pissed. I mean, I would be pissed too if I was Negan, and that well, makes me terrified. When you, see, you know, the, the way the way that they've been decimated, you know, first the first group that they ran into, they completely blew up. Then they go in and kill people in their sleep. They're literally taking knives to their heads. Then in the next right. one, they, they burn. They lock people in and burn them to death. So he's going to come yeah. and be like, what the, f like in a weird way, it's, it, the brutality is like something that Negan would be like, this is awesome. You know, <laughs> this is all right. Yeah. And my kind of guy. <laughs> like, I, yeah, so, I can see him being like, I'm kind of impressed with this, but I'm also fucking pissed off, so right. you had now have to pay. <laughs> what was weird to me was the sort of cultish thing, you know, and you guys, again, are familiar with the comic book where the one guy goes, was Negan there? And he goes, I'm Negan. We're all Negan. We're all here. You know what I mean? So, like, what is that all about? Like, that's kind of was weird because the, the, the second time somebody, oh, the smoking lady said it too. She was like, Negan? What do you know about Negan? She was like, we're, we are Negan, you know? So what is that? What, what, is, what were they getting at there? Um, I think in my perspective, I mean, I think they are probably trying to throw people off of Negan's trail. You know, that, that's a given. They're all, they're trying to be sneaky about something. So, but the other thing is like, I think it has deeper meaning to them because they, you know, they answer to Negan. I think Negan is a part of all of us. He represents that brutality that needs to be had in this world. Even if you think you're the good guy, you still, you are Negan in some way. If you, if the things people have done, what makes you different than anybody else? That's why I think they've constantly, you know, walked that line with where, you know, where do you draw that line? You know, with all the things that you have to do, who's the bad guy and who's the good guy? Oh, yeah, 100%. That line's been blurred really since day one, but uh, now it's getting very blurred. And, and uh, you know, when Carol, Carol basically met Carol in this episode, you know what I'm saying? It was like mm -hmm. the other girl was herself in a sense of what she had to do to survive. And then Carol was like, I didn't want to have to do this to you. This is what I was, because it's like, you're still afraid. Yeah, I was afraid that it would come to this because Carol did not, you know, she's looking at that redhead lady that was the, the main, you know, the, her main capture, but that woman was, a, you know, a secretary and had to go kill these people, you know, had four girls or whatever, and a husband and lost all that. So like, you know, Carol's like, I don't want to have to kill you, but one of us is going to die here, you know? And then Maggie was sitting across from Maggie in a weird way, right? They were like, they were like right. Maggie had to kill Maggie. So, um, yeah, each character did kind of relate to one another. Like there were parallels between the redheaded girl, I'm forgetting her name now, but, um, and Carol, you know, they had similar journeys right. and now they've become this different person. And, you know, obviously the redhead thought, you know, she's more confident in who she is now. But even when that one girl was talking to Maggie, that girl had lost a baby as well. You right, know, exactly. well, not as well. She had lost a baby and now Maggie is pregnant. So they, you know, they kind of have the same stories, but they're on opposite ends, you know, of the spectrum. Right. So it's interesting. Yeah. And then Maggie's like, well, one of us is going to die. And one of us is wrong. 
one of us is right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Uh, in terms of some, one of us is going to die. Well, it's not going to be me. And then she's like, well, one of us is wrong. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I thought it was great. I thought the episode was great. Uh, I heard I heard CJ sigh, though. So, I'm just wondering if you sighing, probably... CJ? No, I did sigh because... I wanted to listen to what you guys had to say because I definitely don't agree with any of it. I don't oh, know. I didn't no. like. I, I didn't like this episode. Don't know why. I think it, it well, just. Well, you have it was to really, try and explain. I will try to explain. Um, okay. I felt like I was right with my prediction last week. This, to me, this was like a filler episode. Um, because after all, it did pretty much take place for the most part while Rick and them were attacking the other place. So there wasn't any real plot movement until technically the very, very end, Um, which obviously sometimes you need to space things out and and add some stuff to give a little break in everything that's going on. Um, Second, I just don't like that Carol is, uh, you know, changing like this. I mean, I get that, you know, Eventually, everybody has to have some sort of big moment that probably will lead to her death. But it seems like they're turning, you know, they did such a great job of turning Carol in the first season from this frail, beaten down woman to like this, you know, rambats pretty much. And now they're kind of showing the cracks in it that seems like it's going to lead to her becoming a little more unstable which isn't a good thing because usually unstable means that uh, she's probably going to die soon, which I don't like. Well, that's the thing is I don't know where, how how far the unstableness will continue because half of her unstableness in this episode was an act for her to escape. And that was the weird thing. That's what, that was the hard thing to watch was kind of going, well, what part of this is the act and what part of this is her sort of feeling like, you know, and so like, she was doing what she had to do to survive with the whole, oh, I'm going to pretend to hyperventilate. I'm going to mm-hmm. get this rosary so I can sharpen it and cut out of the duct tape and all that. And so she was sort of playing the character, you know, basically rope doping these people to think like, oh, gosh, we're in here with somebody that has never even killed somebody before. You know what I mean? Like this woman knows nothing. Uh, and they had no yeah. idea who she was. But then she kind of, revealed a little bit of, like, the woman going, like, you're scared. What do you, you fear death? I'm like, no, I don't fear death. I fear that you're, you know, you're going to die, or I feel like I'm going to have to, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to kill you. You know what I mean? Like, you're not going to let us go, and you don't know who you're messing with and what I'm really capable of doing. And if it gets to the point where I cut myself out of these, this um, duct tape, you're dead. And she, I think she felt like, I, that redhead, she kind of related to her, being like, you should just get out of here, you know? You don't need to do this to us. Because it's only going to end one way. That, it's kind of like right. that one time when Rick said that, too. Remember when, uh, when he was locked in the, um, in Tourmaline. Remember, didn't he have a line like that? Being like, the end of the last... The, I, the, I the, feel like he's uttered that to a lot of people now. <laughs> I feel like he has at this point. <laughs> right, right. Because uh, I think he said that to the redhead girl. What is her name, CJ? So I can stop calling her redhead girl. Uh, I don't know. Um, I, I know, know her, her name act, in real yeah, life. Her, is... Yeah, it's Alicia Witt. But I don't remember her actual yes. character. I think it's like Paula or something like that. I think it is. Yeah, I think it is. Paula. I think he said that but, to her. Didn't he? Or did she say that to him? It's only going to end one way, our way. I think they might have said it to each other. Who knows? But and like (laughs) yeah, uh, my other contention was well, was it still goes with the whole Carol thing is now that they're showing the the cracks in the armor and she's becoming more unstable mentally. uh, It seems like they might be leaning towards killing her off like they did in the comics, which was just a the stupidest death that I've ever seen in the comics. Um, I don't think they'll give her... That would be a disservice to the Carol that we know now, to give her a death like that. Because don't well, they say was, that, like, was, the more important the character is, the better the death? I would, I would I think hope she so. Deserves, yeah. I think she would deserve a good, but yeah, a good Dave, death if she was going to go. 
Well, what, what way, happened? That's, why, that's how we knew Glenn wasn't dead in the first place because it just wasn't a good enough death scene for a character at his level, you know? Right, yeah. Well, yeah, Dave, what happened with Carol in the comics was basically she went through, like, a whole emotional thing, and she actually wound up trying to uh, have a three-way with Rick and Lori, um, which got shut down, and then uh, she caught Tyrese cheating on her with Michonne, and... Uh, I guess she just decided she had enough, and she walked out. This was in the prison. She walked up to the prison yard where they had a, a walker tied up where they were trying to learn how to to do a cesarean um, on it. So when Lori gave birth, they could pull Judith out, and uh, she just walked right up to it and let it chow down on her. Oh, wow. It was pretty weird. <laughs> it wasn't just all of a sudden. It was really just random for her to do that. Yeah. But I will say about Carol, I do have to say, like you guys mentioned, like what part of it was a, ru- a ruse, you know, the way she was acting. I think it was very smart of her to do the hyperventilating thing because if you can talk to people, you have a better chance of getting in their head. And I think she was smart enough to realize that if she could just talk to these people, she could, she could have things go her way. And right. I think, And I saw another article, which I didn't notice at first, but at the beginning when they pull their shirts over their heads and they make them walk and they have that shot of them, you know, walking and we just see their feet, they said that she was deliberately making tracks for Daryl, which is some quick thinking for Carol. And I didn't catch that, but I did hear Daryl at the end of the episode when they came in said, you know, I found your tracks or I followed your tracks or something. So I didn't catch that she did that. So it made me kind of wonder, like, yeah, I think she was putting on an act to, to survive this. But I do think we were seeing parts of how she really felt and where she is at emotionally. So I think she, I, I still have, I still think Carol has a chance. I think she knows what she's doing still, but she's just feeling that burden of killing people very heavily right now. Right. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I, I feel like go back and look at that episode to see the tracks because that makes more sense that she was dragging her feet. You're saying or whatever, right? To through the leaves. Right. And, Basically, yeah, I feel like track them. I, I feel like she's definitely a, a a bigger candidate for me to to meet Lucille in the in the finale for sure by Megan. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Although I like, I do like. I mean, I don't know if they'll take it because that was back in the prison. I don't mind. I like her walking up to a, a zombie and getting eaten, um, just because. This last lady she killed now, that's kind of what she did. She sort of, like, impaled her, and then the, the, the woman got eaten. Like, you know, like, got eaten by the zombie, which was, like, that was pretty painful, you know. Yeah, that the, was pretty the gory. The would have that... much rather have a, a bullet to the head than just get mauled on, mauled on by them. Right. And, geez, that, they did so good with that. I mean, the skin pulling and stretching. When right. You bite. Ew, gross. <laughs> Disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just, I just kind of, well, yeah, I just, I, I kind of felt, to me, the episode was kind of flat. I mean, yeah, there was, there was action, and then there was a little bit, of, like you're saying, of, of story. I don't know. Just this episode didn't speak to me. I guess it's because they really hadn't did much with Maggie for me to care, other than the fact that she's pregnant. And right. Carol... I just don't. I really don't like seeing that done with with the character. I mean, I understand if it's gonna serve a bigger purpose, but I don't know. It's probably one of my least favorite episodes this season. I would say one thing I learned since I don't know anything about the Saviors is they are a far more organized group of people than Rick and his group. They are way more organized in terms of when they had those radios and they were switching to the radio frequencies and. You know, all the various, like... I think that at the end of the episode, Carol realized that. Because when she was talking to those ladies and they all blurted that line, she was like, what does that mean? And then at the end when he said it again, I think that look, almost the look on her face to me was realization that this is, oh shit, this is a lot bigger than we think it is. Like, they are really, they're, they're covering somebody up, obviously, and she heard, you know, when the Paula was on the radio and signaling everybody and all these teams and all these, co- you know, codes speak between them. I mean, she has to realize that 
Wow. Yeah, now I know what it means. They're, well, this is larger well, yeah. than us. Yeah, that and the, I mean, like you were just saying, and, and David had mentioned earlier with them attacking, I mean, they got to realize, I mean, that, they, that obviously there's a lot more saviors than there is people in our group, seeing as how Rick's group has went through three almost waves of people, and they're still no closer to finding Negan. Right. So, I mean, and, and those are, you know, big compounds. And just look at the amount of armory that they had when, when Rick and them attacked last week. I mean, when when Negan comes, they're, they're definitely in for some shit. I don't think they, they realize how, how much they are in for yet. Yeah. yeah. And, Rick and, and Rick and company don't even know. I don't think they've heard any, anybody else utter the line, I am Negan. Only Carol and has heard multiple people say it. So she's got this information that she needs to, I hope she shares with the group because otherwise they're, they'd be just, she'd be leading them in blind to not tell them, hey, these two other people just said the same exact thing. And I heard, you know, I heard their code words and everything to each other. This is not something to take lightly, Rick. So I hope somebody, I hope somebody just stands up to Rick because he does need to just, Come back to reality, whatever reality is now, but just come back down, Rick, because this is definitely not a team effort. He's basically leading his people to slaughter. We haven't seen the slaughter yet. That will be the finale, but that's essentially what he's well, doing. I have a feeling that we are uh, going to lose at least one of the cast members next week. Um, it's, it's on IMDb that uh, Dwight returns this coming week. Um, and I don't know if you remember Dave, but Dwight was the guy who, who stole Daryl's crossbow and, and bike in the first half of the season. That guy's returning. Yeah, I don't remember that. Um, remember, he, he he was with that group with the girl who had diabetes? Yeah. Was it, was and, it uh, they, So was it one guy? Well, the guy that got away. They wound up, Daryl came back and helped him because that, that was yeah. the first experience of the Saviors as well because they were coming to get him. Right, because apparently he had left with his wife and whatnot. Um, but then uh, Daryl helped him escape from the, the saviors. Right. And then Dwight double-crossed him, stole his uh, crossbow and his bike, and went off. I was wondering why he didn't have the crossbow. I guess I didn't catch he stole the crossbow. I don't even remember him stealing the bike. Yeah, he, he, he knocked, he knocked Daryl out. The girls. They got, like melted in that glass house, right? The girls did. Yeah. So I, I guess I didn't realize what, what happened with the guy. But, yeah, yeah so that, 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 guy, is, that guy is coming back. Yeah. That, that means they're pretty on pace with the comic issues. I mean, I think I read that this, this last episode kind of followed the pace of issue 97. My only thing that I missed was, and I'm not saying I missed it, but the, the one girl brought... Um, Maggie into the room and being like, you know, where, where, where's your compound? Where are you guys at? And it was like this kind of interrogation scene, but nothing, nothing happened. I thought she was going to beat her or do something, you know, and it just kind of was in talking and then it just cut to her tied up again. You know what I mean? And it was kind of like, what the, right. what did I miss something? Cause maybe sometimes I step away. Um, when I'm watching it on the, um, the, uh, uh, streaming, sometimes it locks up and I have to kind of restart it. And so I, sometimes I think, oh, did I just miss a scene? But did, was there no real sort of like interrogation? It was just kind of them chatting for a little bit and then what, where did the girl go? You know, it's like... Movie yeah, magic. I'll have to watch it again too. I don't really remember. I, yeah, now that you say that, it does kind of seem like she did just kind of like, what, it just stopped? Yeah, I'll have to go back right. and look. And it's like, where, where did she go? I don't know. She went to the bathroom. We'll find That's a deleted her. scene. Yeah, next time I'll see her, we'll just shoot her in the head. <laughs> it's like she, right. she, went down, she went down to get a soda out of the machine. You know what I mean? It's like, where the hell did she go? <laughs> yeah. but, all right, well, let's chat next week. I think it's going to be a good one, though. I think, I think that's what you're going to get. You're going to get this. Good one next week. Then it'll, the next one after that will set up for the big finale. You know, so... Oh, yeah. Lots to talk about, I'm sure. Talk to everybody next week.
we're going to roll a, a Bill Mosley interview today too, right? Yeah. That's awesome. Exactly. That's good. I, I, you know, cause it's sort of interesting that I just got booked into this mad monster party here in Charlotte where we will be able to, uh, where you and I will see Bill Mosley in person again. So. Yeah. And, uh, he did give you a shout out on this, uh, this interview. So, you know, definitely can do something with the, uh, what, what did he do on the shout out? Just go, Oh, Dave. Yeah. I like Dave. Uh, I don't remember. Um, I have okay. to play it. But it yeah. was at the end. I think he was something along the lines of tell Dave I said hey or something like that. Um, and, and, you know, this and that. Something like that. Because that's what Tony Todd said as well. He was like, tell, tell Dave I said hi. Tell Dave I said hi. Well, all right. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dave and Crete Show. I am here with Bill Mosley. Yes. Hello. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing well, thank you. Hi. Our uh, podcast co-host, Dave, uh, Dave Sheridan, says he wishes he could join us, but he's, he's building a house in Charlotte right now, but sends his... Uh, he's building himself. a house in Charlotte? Yes. Oh. Got some bread, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, I want some of that, Dave. <laughs> Thank you again for taking the interview. Everybody knows you, obviously, as Otis and the Devil's Rejects and Chop Top and Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Um, out of your career, other than those two that, that you're most known for, what are some of your uh, personal favorite characters? Well, of course, there's Luigi, Luigi Largo in a movie called Repo the Genetic Opera, which kind of morphed into uh, The Magician in uh, uh, The Devil's Carnival 1 and 2. Um, I certainly love playing Johnny in, uh, Night in the uh, Tom Savini color remake of Night of the Living Dead. Uh, what else did I do? Played Mayor Buckman in uh, 1001 Maniacs or 2001. I, don't, I think some, some Maniacs have slipped away, but 2001 Maniacs. And, uh, yeah. I like playing Dr. Von Strasse in uh, Rob Zombie's fake trailer for uh, Grindhouse little uh, trailer of a movie called uh, Werewolf Women of the SS. So, uh, yeah, I get along, I get around, I do a lot of different things, and I'm very happy to, uh, you know, take on any new character that, that wants me. And now, um, you played, like, like we were talking about, you played uh, Chop Top in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. How was it, uh, after being, after that movie, you know, helped get you out there, to come back a couple years ago and do uh, another Texas Chainsaw, but this time in a, a different character? How was it, though, to return to the franchise? Well, it was very cool to actually to do it. Um, I was actually um, uh, playing uh, Drayton Sawyer, which, of course, was uh, Jim Sedow's famous role in, uh, in Chainsaw 1 and 2. Uh, Jim uh, passed away a while ago, and so I was very honored that they want, wanted me to actually play his character. Uh, it was a bit of a, you know, it was some pressure because, uh, you know, I love Jim and I wanted to do right by Drayton. So I uh, worked very hard on it, uh, trying to get uh, Jim's body movements down. And he really had kind of, a, kind of a strange movements, so uh, it took a while to figure out how to, how to do that. Um, but uh, I did get to say, look what your brother did to the door, which, uh, you know, was my, you know, fan moment, um, in, you know, in Chainsaw 3D. Um, so uh, we did actually shoot it. I, I, I guess I can tell you this now, but we shot it in Louisiana outside of Shreveport. So, uh, you know, outside of uh, Bossier City. And so uh, it really was... Honestly, it was the Louisiana Chainsaw Massacre, but uh, but don't tell anybody. Secret safe with me. Yes. Um, now, for the <laughs> for the role of uh, Otis, did you use any sort of inspirations in uh, creating that character? Um, I didn't. I actually, uh, you know, at first when when Rob wanted me to play Otis for in uh, House of a Thousand Corpses, I really thought that Rob just wanted a kind of a reheated chop top. Uh, but Rob uh, wanted, he saw in me something I didn't see, which was kind of a badass, you know, uh, hot looking dude. You know, a lot of, uh, you know, Otis is kind of a sex symbol in a strange way, unlike Chop Top. And uh, I never really thought of myself as that kind of guy. Um, so Rob uh, gently but firmly pried my hands off Chop Top and led me to Otis. Um, once I found Otis, 
which was about maybe a month after we finished shooting House of a Thousand Corpses. That was kind of my, kind of had Otis, but I was, I was still groping a bit. Rob uh, you know, gave me some good mannerisms and, and some good suggestions, which got me closer to Otis. But I didn't really find Otis until maybe a month or six weeks after we'd finished shooting. Rob needed some more footage, so we, we went over to Wayne Toth, uh, the makeup person's uh, studio, and we shot a black and white segment called the, I, I call it the Run Rabbit Run segment, where it just has me looking at camera going, you know, hunting humans ain't nothing but nothing. They all run like scared little rabbits. Run, rabbit, run. Run, rabbit! And uh, so um, that was when I finally got Otis. It was like, whoa, that's Otis. So when we did uh, Devil's Rejects, I had Otis, and I really hit the ground running with him. Didn't have to, you know, find the character. A lot of times, and uh, I do a lot of uh, you know, low-budget independent features, and what happens is, um, you know, you're given a script, and you read the script, and you, you know, get ready to uh, uh, play the character, but you really haven't talked to the director, uh, you haven't met your other cast members, there's no rehearsal, you kind of fly in one night and you're shooting the next day. So a lot of times you don't really know the character that well. Um, actually with The Devil's Rejects, it's the only time I've ever played the same character twice, to tell you the truth. So um, that was a great advantage because I knew the character. And uh, as I say, I hit the ground running and uh, you know, really had a ball shooting Devil's Rejects, even though it was a really tough shoot. You know, we uh, did the whole thing in 30 days. Hence, uh, you know, on the deluxe DVD, there's a second disc that's called 30 Days in Hell, which is, uh, you know, a documentary basically following uh, the shooting, the making of uh, Devil's Rejects. Yeah, that was an amazing documentary. And uh, speaking of Rob Zombie, you collaborated with him on multiple projects. Um, how was it working on the remake of Halloween? Uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, I actually, uh, it, was, it was interesting because uh, that was the, the movie right after Devil's Rejects. And uh, I, I wasn't a part of the, the, the regular cast in Halloween. Um, and uh, Rob, I guess, showed it to uh, the Weinstein company that produced Halloween. And they liked it so much they gave him some more money uh, after he had finished shooting to add a few scenes. And so uh, Tommy Tolles and Leslie Easterbrook and I are in a, one scene as uh, security guards. And then we get killed by Michael Myers. So that was actually, uh, you know, that's, that's always a feather in your cap. And, uh, and uh, he also added Sid in a, in a scene with Malcolm McDowell as the, you know, the graveyard keeper or whatever Sid was. Uh, so that's basically all we got to see of it. But um, I, I loved the movie. I thought it was pretty awesome. And um, then uh, in Halloween 2, I, I did a brief stint as um, like a local horror host. Um, and, uh, you know, that movie was good, too. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you again for your time. Is there any other films that you're working on right now that you'd like to promote? Um, I think at the end of the month I'm doing something called Lou's Place, L-O-U apostrophe S, down in uh, San Diego. Um, it's like a horror movie, uh, centers around a card game. Um, and also, uh, you know, I have some music that I made with uh, uh, Phil Anselmo of that, that group Down and Pantera. And um, I call it Phil and Bill out of respect to him. He calls it Bill and Phil out of respect to me. So one of these days we've, we've got songs, and uh, I'm just kind of waiting for Phil to uh, finish uh, mixing them and finalizing them. And uh, so that's something that's coming out one of these days. Uh, Phil and Bill, it's called uh, Songs of Darkness and Despair. <laughs> They're a happy contribution to the music world. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's what's going on. Well, awesome. I want to thank you again. You've been an awesome guest. Uh, and we hope to have you on again in the future. Well, that'd be great. Thank you very much. Up next is an interview with Chris from CNV Promotions. Enjoy. Hey, Creech. Hello, Chris. How are you? Oh, awesome, man. How are you doing? I am doing pretty good. 
why don't you start off by letting everybody out there know a little bit more about CNV Promotions. So I'm with CNV Promotions, uh, which we represent over 80 celebrity clients that we book into various appearances all around the world. And uh, we've been in existence since 2010. This is our sixth year and uh, keep getting bigger and bigger here, booking everywhere. So it's called CMV Promotions. Your first name's Chris. Who is the mysterious V in CMV Promotions? Uh, that's a good question. I'm glad you brought that up. Not many people know this. Uh, C actually stands for Chris. And then the V uh, is my partner, Stacy. Uh, her nickname for the past 20 years has been Mrs. V. Uh, you know, because of the Friday the 13th genre there. So it kind of just came together one day as, hey, let's be CMV promotions, and it's stuck since then. So not many people know what the V stands for. <laughs> exactly. So what is it about conventions that you love the most? Well, I'm really a fan of, of everything together, the horror, the pop culture, the comedy, the sci-fi, you know, anything geeky and nerdy I can get into. Seeing as how you've been doing this for six years now, do you have any awesome collectibles that you've picked up throughout the years that you'd like to share? Well, I have a, a bunch of items that I hold dearly to me, one which is my Devil's Rejects poster. I'm a big fan of... A Nightmare on Elm Street, the original 1984 film. So I have a, a piece here that I've been uh, started probably back in 2003 uh, of the original film there with Robert and Wes Craven and uh, Johnny Depp. And and that's one of my prized possessions there that uh, I have right behind me on the man cave wall. Nice. Another one that I can say is I have a, a custom Friday the 13th uh, artwork that was done in Canada uh, with over 100 signatures from the series on it that, again, I started way back in the day and kind of uh, morphed into today. So, you know, that, that I'm really proud of. It's kind of a unique, uh, you know, one-of-a-kind Canadian artwork piece. Well, I love the art because it blends all the Friday the 13th movies together. Like it's a kind of a comedic piece where, you know, it has Jason with little f funny comic bubbles. And, you know, there's like a scene from every Friday the 13th movie that's kind of blended into each other, starting with the first all the way up to Freddy versus Jason. And I thought, you know, that's a badass piece. And I could get all the actors to sign it. So it was kind of, you know, best of both worlds. And I, I don't know how the hell I'm going to frame this thing because it's like eight foot long. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And it's one piece that I can get them all to sign. So it's whenever a Friday guest comes out that I haven't met yet. You know, I break out the old poster there and get them on it. So it's it kind of works out. So, Chris, am I high maintenance or low maintenance? Just tell my audience that uh, you, you could be totally honest. Come on. What am I? Wow. High maintenance for sure. I'll tell you what, the, the convention thing was really getting on me when I had to spend every convention in the bathroom with you uh, changing into your doofy outfit and I had to look <laughs> at your underwear all the time. Okay, wait a second, though. That was your guy's idea for me to even do do feast. <laughs> That's the price you pay. <laughs> You booked me for the doofy photo shoots. I'm like, oh, yeah, man. I I remember you grabbing that vacuum cleaner several times there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you brought the vacuum cleaner. What do you expect when you give Doofy the vacuum cleaner? Hey, speaking of Doofy, you guys, I was texting my friends with all this mess with the presidential stuff and this Trump and Clinton and Sanders. I really do think the door is open for Doofy to run for president. I really think that the he might actually get some votes. You know, some people just so fed up with it that he would get some votes. What do you guys think? So who are you, two, Chris, out of your clients? And I know you're not going to name name, but uh, so don't name any names, obviously. But what's the craziest thing that has ever happened with one of your clients? Well, of course, it wasn't one of my clients. I would never rat out one of my clients. But, I mean, we've already seen requests for cocaine and hookers. And, you know, it gets pretty crazy sometimes. Yeah, the hooker one is kind of crazy. I could, the Cocaine, I, I can kind of see if you're in a different city 
And you, you know, Chris, you're their agent. So it's like, Hey, can you get me some cocaine? But if you're going to get a hooker, you, that's something you should do on your own. Don't you think <laughs> it's like, no, I mean, every, they want their, their butts wiped and, and everything handed to them. So why not bring in hookers too? I mean, we're, we're their agent. We got to make it happen, baby. Well, I didn't know that before. Now you got Chris Knight. I guess I'm not so, uh, uh, low maintenance. I might, I might start to turn into a little high maintenance now. This, uh, this is all news to me. I, I didn't know I was able to get this type of service. <laughs> if you kept something, from yeah, me, I can't I put this kind of stuff in your head. Now you'll be bugging me for the the crack to. Yeah, I thought I was pushing you for chili fries and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> When we go out to the diner, I thought like, hey, man, uh, can you give me a lift to the diner? I didn't know that also came with a side of hooker. <laughs> it's like a, oh, and, and the hookers. That's good. Um, so, and what's the favorite, what's your, what's one of your favorite cons you like to, to work? And, well, there's a difference. What's, a, what's one of the conventions you like to go to as, you know, a fan and like, like to be there? And what's a convention, what's your favorite one to work? Well, I have a few conventions that I really enjoy doing, uh, and you know they're they're long running conventions, like uh, you know Chiller Theater in New Jersey and uh, Har Hound Weekend, and actually coming up this weekend in Cincinnati. All right, guys, we're gonna have to cut it here for the interview. Uh, thank you again, Chris, for for coming on the podcast and talking to me and Dave. If you want to follow Chris. Make sure you check him out on Facebook at CNV Promotions. And also you can check him out personally on Twitter at the Demon DJ, Or you can check him out uh, as part of CNV at CNV Promotions. I thought that was cool that we chatted with Chris, though. I mean, I wanted to kill two birds with one stone. I owed him a call <laughs> about Mad Monster Party because he literally texted me saying, all right, you're in. And I wanted to clarify, okay, what do I need to bring? You know, and then uh, if there was anything you and I needed to do specifically to do our podcast stuff. All right. Well, that was uh, episode 11. And that was, I thought I was, I think this was a, a, a different look. They're all different. Every one of these shows is different. This time having Chris on because I needed to do some business. So I killed two birds with one stone. We chatted a little bit about, you know, the upcoming uh, Mad Monster Party in Charlotte that he booked me in. But also we got to chat with Chris about, you know, sort of what, how he became an agent in the sort of um, personal appearance agency stuff and uh, how he's a fan and a really avid collector of some very cool items, mostly in the horror department. But, and uh, so I think we covered a lot of stuff here. Uh, I hope, I hope everyone enjoyed it. And it was a good interview with Bill Mosley, dude. So we got prison Thank break you. coming back. Am I missing anything else? No, Kevin, just, just Kevin wrestling. Cochran. What's his name? Kevin Cochran. What? <laughs> no, Kevin Keith Cochran. Kevin Keith Cochran. Got it. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And, do you, you know, know what his initials are though? Do you know his initials are KKK? Yes, I do. Did you, does he know that? that he he does know that. It was done, done on purpose. I know. I'm joking. I'm good. I'm going to keep at when, when I do meet him though, I'm going to, I'm going to act like I don't get that. Why he did that. I'm like, don't, don't you know, it's KKK. Don't you, you didn't know that man. Uh, and, and by the way, if, if he ever wrestles the profile, we're coming at him strong. We're going to come at him strong with that. He's going to be, he's not going to want to wrestle the profile because he, I just don't think it's up to his. He, I don't know if he's up there yet. I don't know if he's ready. So okay. me, you, and Chris Berry, we'll, we'll see everybody next week. On yes, David Creech. Sounds perfect. Shut, Shut up, up and sit down. down. Thank you for listening to the David Creech Show. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of Dave and CJ. These views and opinions do not necessarily represent those of Creech Creative Productions or any of its affiliates.